All right, Rachel, Rachel, thank you for, for joining me. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, nature, natural sounds happening in the background there. Yeah, there's a lot of like birds and wildlife and dogs and children and people um, in Mexico. It's definitely an, kind of an outdoor lifestyle. So you just have to roll with the punches in terms of the background noise. Yeah, for real. I mean, I haven't been to Mexico in so long, but it's a, it's an amazing country. Uh, what are you what are you out there for? So I came down to Mexico because a friend of mine invited me to go on a trip with her to Mexico City. I actually met her in Mexico City in May. Um, and she planned this like whole bonanza that involved like uh, Dia de los Muertos. So we went, we had our faces painted and we saw like all of the kind of traditional customs of the holiday and then did all kinds of amazing things, hot air balloon rides and just, it was an amazing trip. And since I was coming all the way down to Mexico, um, I've always really wanted to learn how to surf and I, you know, every year or so I'll go to a surf camp for like five days um, to try to hone my skills a little bit. So I came down to Puerto Escondido here in the state of Oaxaca um, to, to work on my surfing a little bit. Wow, that sounds like an amazing trip. And um, I think most of our listeners would be quite jealous. But speaking of your, your trip to Mexico, I know that you've had quite a journey to be able to go to Mexico whenever you want, because I know that you mentioned this isn't the first time you've been to Mexico just this year. So I think the listeners want to know a little bit more about you know, where you started and how you came to be going to Mexico whenever you want. Yeah, so um, I'm very fortunate, but also worked really hard to become financially independent this year. So I retired from my job in June. Um, and now my boyfriend and I travel full time. Um, so right now I'm here in Mexico and he's actually just working for a couple of months in Europe. So um, because he's British, so he works in Europe. Um, so while he's away, I decided to come down to Mexico. Um, and my financial independence journey started about, well, it started in around 2014. Um, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which um, for, I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but it is a degenerative joint condition. So over time, your joints will um, kind of get a little bit disfigured and become less functional. And you see, it's quite common. You'll see it in, in old people who have very like gnarled hands and joints. Um, and so when I got diagnosed with that, I realized I was super unhappy with my desk job. I, I loved what I was doing, but just the amount of time in an office was just not working for me. I just love to have freedom and be able to do whatever I wanted. And so when I had the realization that there was a pretty distinct possibility that by the time traditional retirement age came around, I wouldn't be able to do the things that I really wanted to do with my time, especially as, you know, a 65 year old woman, it's a very different story than it is when you're in thirties. Um, I started to kind of research and figure out what some of my options were in order to have a more flexible, more independent, um, sort of time rich life. So that's kind of how I got started on this path to financial independence. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing that you managed to pivot a diagnosis like that and turn it into something that's serving you really well. Now I know you pretty well and I know about your background, but, uh, what were you doing before you retired? So before I retired, I was the vice president of a women's fashion company, um, and the job was super creative and exciting, and I worked with really amazing, talented women and men who, you know, were really giving it their all, and our business was very, very successful, um, but it was very, very time intensive, very stressful, um, and I just, I felt that it wasn't something I could do sustainably for the rest of my life, so um, as much as I love fashion and I actually find in retirement, I'm kind of missing fashion because when you travel full time, you have very little with you. Um, you know, I don't drag big suitcases around. I just have a 40 liter pack. So, um, you know, fashion was amazing. And I'm so grateful that I got to have such a you know, pivotal role in, in the brands that I worked on. Um, but it is, you know, if you've seen the Devil Wears Prada, it's not a poor uh, representation of the industry. Uh, it sounds like a pretty difficult industry, but you clearly love fashion. It seems like, despite the fact that you're in Mexico, there's not a lot of uh, opportunities to don your your flashiest outfits while you're while you're living the life out there. No, it's a lot of like I have one pair of black pants and one pair of blue jeans and two t-shirts and you know one sweater and one jacket. So it's a uh, it's a little limited in that regard. Like you know, there are certain things about this lifestyle that. I thought I would just totally be able to get used to, and I still haven't quite adjusted. It's been about six months, so um, 
you know, we'll see how I adjust as time continues, I suppose. Yeah, so to, to, to go back a little bit, you, you said you started this journey in 2014. And just so people can appreciate how, I guess, how significant the decision you made is and how quickly everything transpired, like, if you don't mind sharing with our listeners, how old are you now? So I'm, I'm 36 now. So I was diagnosed when I was about 29 and I didn't immediately, like this wasn't like I got diagnosed and then two weeks later realized I needed to change my life. It was a very like slow dawning realization. Um, and I'm sure, you know, some of your listeners understand what it's like to live with certain amounts of chronic pain. I think I'm very, very lucky that my arthritis is super well controlled um, and it does not limit my life really as much as it does for many, many other people who suffer from this condition. But it was definitely like a slow dawning realization um, that I wanted to check out and find out if there was just like, what are people doing who don't work all the time? Like there have to be people who don't have to do this every day. Um, and so I met with a financial planner um, who suggested that I do what's called house hacking, which is it typically it means buying a multifamily property and you live in one unit and your tenants pay the bulk of your mortgage. So you can drastically reduce your spending so that you can take your extra money and invest it in the stock market. So I started working towards buying a multifamily property in Brooklyn. Um, and so I was really like just penny pinching every which way I possibly could, you know, and this was probably over the course of two or three years. Um, and then, um, you know, I kind of through all of the real estate research I was doing, I found the concept of FIRE, which stands for financial independence, retire early, and started doing a lot of reading on, you know, how that works. There's, of course, many ways to skin the cat, but um, in general, there's a pretty well understood theory that's called the 4% rule. And the basic gist on that is that if you can live on 4% of your total net worth, you will be able to live on that forever. You will not run out of money. Um, so, so that's kind of the goal is to figure out how much money do you need to spend annually and how much money do you need to have in investments that are, you know, creating returns. So dividends and just capital gains growth, uh, in order to live off of your capital gains, basically. So it was sort of a long, slow process, but in the end, because I was saving for this house, which I'm, I'm sure many people realize that buying a home in Brooklyn costs well over a million dollars. I was super aggressively saving and doing everything I possibly could to increase my personal income as well. So actively looking for raises, actively figuring out ways to make extra money on the side um, so that I would be able to build up that nest egg. Yeah, wow. It seems like you really had a strong understanding of what you needed to do to get to the next level and continue building. And, and even if you didn't end up buying the house, your, your net worth slowly started to increase to a point where, where here you are now. But obviously many things in life are easier said than done. And I think, you know, you make this sound very easy, but I'm sure that during the course of the past few years, there have been some challenges you've had to, to face in your search for financial free, freedom. So could you elaborate on any, like any challenges you might've had along this journey? Yeah. So, um, it definitely was not easy. And I, I, I know that people think like, oh, she was, you know, I, I was a relatively high wage earner. So that is one thing uh, that I want to say that makes it significantly easier. But I also stayed in, I kept my lifestyle well, well below my means. So that meant that as my friends were moving into nicer, bigger apartments with more amenities, closer to the city or closer to neighborhoods that were desirable, I was staying in small old apartments because housing is the most expensive thing for almost everybody in New York City. It's usually where the biggest chunk of your um, income goes. So I was definitely watching my friends' lifestyles improve as we were all earning more money um, and mine was not. Um, and that includes things like I was pretty stingy about taking Ubers and lifts and things like that because uh, again, transportation, you know, if you have a Metro card, you can get anywhere. You just have to plan for it and be patient. Um, and then there was also just a lot of declining social invitations because, um, you know, going out to dinner is really expensive. So if you, if I didn't truly, truly want to do that, even, I mean, I even declined attending um, a couple of weddings that were 
far away and expensive and I was single at the time. So I was going to have to pay for the entire hotel room, the entire rental car. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of kind of social pressure. I think that's the hardest thing is to, to stay focused on your goals and understand that yes, other people might be buying themselves, you know, a coffee and avocado toast for breakfast every day and going to sweet green for lunch and getting takeout for dinner. And I am going to be eating oatmeal at home and doing something very affordable for lunch and cooking my dinner and doing that, you know, six nights a week. So, um, you know, and also being really stingy about what I bought in terms of groceries as well. Um, so it's definitely like, it was a, an exercise in discipline, which I think is something that's really, um, you hear about this a lot in financial independence. People compare it to physical wellness and physical fitness because there are so many correlations between the two. Mm. Yeah, first of all, um, sweet green is, is good. So if you decide to get sweet green for lunch, like I don't think Rachel is mean to shit on sweet green. So uh, big oh, up. I love sweet green. That's big what up. I'm saying. <laughs> so it was like a big sacrifice not to have sweet green because I yeah. love it, you know? Uh, absolutely. And I, I mean, you you live you had lived in New York for so long. I currently live in New York, but for anyone who doesn't live in New York, like the options are kind of endless for whatever you want to eat at any given time. It's kind of available to you, but it does come at a cost, as Rachel was was talking about. Now, I know you did mention that the process was a little bit easier for you because you were a higher uh, wage earner, but for someone who's not necessarily you know, earning as much as you are. I know you said that you, you want to do everything you can to progressively get a higher salary to increase your net worth. But what are some immediate changes maybe that people can implement if they're not in that situation? Yeah. So one of the first things, like really, truly the first step is just to figure out what your debt is. So if you are carrying a credit card balance, um, making lifestyle shifts to pay off debt is like the most important thing, especially debt that is carrying an interest rate that's higher than 7%, um, because 7% is about what the market grows at. So every penny that you're putting towards debt that is higher than 7% is money that you're losing to someone that you could be investing in the market. So step one is really to get your debt under control. Um, but in terms of spending, I mean, I know this isn't sexy and nobody wants to hear this, but um, really understanding what a budget is that's workable for you might be. Um, so especially if you're young and, you know, you're single, having roommates or living in a shared housing situation is one of the easiest ways to save money. Um, you know, it, I know that nobody wants to do it, but I did it until I was 35. And for the last three or four years of it, I had a roommate who worked night shift. So uh, by the time I came home from work, he was long gone and he slept like a rock. So I could, you know, play the radio and whatever I wanted in the morning before I left for work and he would never hear it. So we didn't see each other very much and he was incredibly clean and respectful and I really liked him as a person. So. Um, that was a big sacrifice that I made. Also, um, transportation, I know I mentioned that, but a lot of people, especially if you do not live in New York City, you must have a car, um, but people purchase cars based on what they want, not based on what they can afford. So um, if you are serious about kind of reducing your expenditures, making sure that you are driving a vehicle that is extremely reliable and extremely affordable and extremely fuel efficient, um, those, those three things make a huge difference. Um, and then just figuring out what your budget is and, and, and sticking to it. So I did want to just quickly touch on earning more money though, because I think a lot of people, uh, don't believe that they are in a place where they can earn more money or they deserve to earn more money. Um, but asking for raises and understanding how to ask for raises is one of the most important things that I did. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, your company is not incentivized to pay you more money. They want you to stay at the salary that you're at, but in every job, you're a little bit of a salesman. You're selling your company on why you deserve more and why you're such a huge asset to the company. So doing a little bit of research and being prepared for your performance reviews and actively seeking more money is I think even easier than cutting expenses. And especially right now, the job market is so strong. Um, employers are desperately seeking people. It's a great time to consider changing companies if uh, you're unhappy or you think that you could make more money elsewhere. That is actually the fastest way to to start building wealth is to just earn more money. And I think doing it in your nine to five is the easiest way to do it before you start a side hustle. Yeah, I feel that. And, you know, especially here in New York City, where, where there's so many opportunities for, for growth professionally, 
I think a lot of it comes down to not being afraid to take a chance that if you ask, you're going to be in bad standing in your company. So definitely, I, I, I really feel that piece of advice. And I also feel the piece of advice that you did not mention going on free Hinge or Tinder dates in order to save money on dinner so that you can continue to compile wealth. So I'm grateful that there are people like you out there because this is a thing, this does happen. And uh, listen, I'm everyone goes about life the way that they want to, but uh, women out there and men, uh, be considerate of other people when you're when you're going on dates. Don't just do it for, for free dinners. That was a tangent, but we'll get back. <laughs> I, I just I don't know why I thought about that when you were talking about um, uh, cost cutting strategies. Uh, yeah, and I think also if you're in the situation where you ask somebody on the date and you're going to be treating them, you have to get a little bit creative. I know it's difficult in the winter because you can't necessarily go and do things outside and we are approaching colder weather. But, you know, in the spring and summer, you know, getting iced coffees and going for a walk in the park or um, inviting someone to a free museum or other things that are, you know, a great way to really get to know somebody that does not involve spending, you know, 150 bucks. So, you know, there's definitely ways to get to know people and you just have to get creative a little bit. And instead of saying like, hey, why don't you meet me at the bar that's downstairs from my apartment? It's, it's like, hey, let's go to the Whitney on, you know, Saturday afternoon or, you know, if you live in New York City or let's go for a walk along the river or let's have a picnic in Central Park. I'll bring a bottle of wine, whatever yep. it is. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can have an awesome date that's $20 and you get an opportunity to really meet the other person, um, you know, and get creative about it. Yep. I literally went to the Whitney a couple of weeks ago and it was a really amazing time. Uh, so I can attest to that. Rachel, Rachel knows, Rachel knows. Um, and I think before we get into our next point that as you increase your net worth, it also allows you to have a little bit more flexibility in making decisions toward what you need and what you want. You might be able to have more of what you want while also still maintaining what you need. And if you are cognizant of your financial goals, you can still, even if you don't pursue exactly what you want, now there's just more money that you're funneling into to the stock market and making investments. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, you have to think about it as investing in yourself too. So if you feel that you're being underpaid, buy yourself a book about how to, you know, how to improve so that you can earn more money. Um, you know, take the time to really put effort into your performance evaluations or, you know, ask your boss for a 15 minute touch base so you can talk about how you're doing. Um, you know, a lot of it just comes down to taking ownership of the situation for yourself and acknowledging that like you are your own best resource and things are not gonna fall into your lap. So there's this concept of like radical um, accountability and, and it's just completely taking ownership of yourself and your life and understanding that, you know, no matter what your background is or where you came from, of course, privilege plays a role. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that it doesn't, but um, you know, the only person who can change your situation is you. So if you really want it, whether you want to retire early or you're just trying to get out of debt or you want to build some wealth so you can help take care of your parents as they age, you know, it, it doesn't have to come back to the early retirement idea. But you know, if you are serious about changing your financial situation and building wealth, the only person who can make that change is you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, most of you, most of my listeners wouldn't know this, but the way Rachel and I became connected is that she was looking for a trainer earlier this year in order to help her meet fitness goals. And, you know, fitness goals were something that she wanted. And in the midst of making these, this financial journey, she decided to make an investment in hiring me to help her meet her fitness goals. And I think, I, I kind of want to hear your take on how that experience was because you were very stern about exactly what you wanted and you had a pretty clear vision about, um, I think you were the best negotiator out of, of any of my clients. And, and that doesn't mean that everyone can get, get over on me when they're making um, transactions with me, but she knew exactly what she wanted and how it was going to work out. And I was amenable to, to being by her side every step of the way. So tell me a little bit about, you know, how you, aligned your fitness goals with your financial goals and how it served you in the, in the end. Yeah, so I, I know I mentioned already that I have rheumatoid arthritis, but I found Jordan because I was looking for a gym where I could work with someone who would really understand what that meant. Um, and, you know, Jordan has is a doctor, he gets it. So um, I, he was connected to me 
through a local gym that's near my apartment. And um, like he said, you know, I was really clear on what I was looking for in terms of time resources and my fitness goals. And a lot of that came from me feeling like it was getting to be the end of my time working and I wanted to come into my retirement in good shape. And I felt really confident that investing in learning how to take care of my body and and kind of having that skill set was something that was worth doing. And I loved the accountability of having a trainer. I mean, I certainly could have just gone to the gym and taken some classes or signed up for like an online course for fitness, um, but I needed the accountability. And so also I think that when you spend money on something, you take it more seriously. And since I knew that Jordan was basically like at the top of his field, I wasn't just hiring somebody who um, didn't really totally understand and was just going to kind of give me a cookie cutter experience. I knew that with Jordan, I was going to get a really personalized experience. And so I was getting what I paid for and I would only get as much out of it as I put into it as well. So, you know, and I think that one of the misconceptions with, um, budgeting and, and with financial freedom is that you don't pay for anything and you're super cheap and you won't get a, you know, you won't get whatever it is. You won't get a Coke at a restaurant or you won't get cheese on your burger or, you know, you're super penny pinching about everything, but it's actually not about that. It's about figuring out what your priorities are and saying, yes, I do want to pay for this. So for me, my priorities had always been experiences. So I wanted to work out with Jordan. I was also, I make pottery. So I wanted to pay for my pottery studio. I love to travel. I paid for that. And in exchange for that, I lived, you know, as I said, I cut my cost of living as much as I could and kept my food budget, you know, not in a starvation way, but just, you know, instead of eating meat every, every single day with dinner or eating entirely organic or whatever, I was a little bit more flexible about how to achieve my fitness goals. Like I found a way to find the money for it because it was important to me. Yeah. And just to give you guys a, a background, and when I first met Rachel, she was definitely open-minded about trying many things, but I don't think she ever thought that she would be deadlifting 155 pounds by by the end of her tenure with me, but that that definitely happened. And I think one of the, the great things was watching, and I, I guess I could tell you this directly, just watching you grow as, as someone who took resistance training very seriously from like feeling uncomfortable with the kettlebell against your wrist to really embracing what resistance training did to your body, but also I think to your, your overall well being. Um, so definitely. And I actually think like, I know I keep kind of coming back to this analogy between finances and fitness, but I think fitness is something that you can really embrace. And there's a, a version of it that works for everybody. And it's about figuring out what it was. And if you had asked me a year ago, if I thought that I would be really excited about deadlifting 155 pounds or really excited about coming in and doing squats and whatever else we were doing, I mean, we did all kinds of different things in our sessions. I would have been like, no, like I'm not a meathead. I'm not interested in that. Like I love yoga. I love Pilates, but actually I found it so gratifying and I loved the reward that I got from watching myself improve uh in in these things and i think um you know for me that was that was awesome like i really really enjoyed um sort of the 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 gratification of my own success and it's very tangible with fitness as well you know you can literally say okay I, last week i did this with 10 kilograms and this week i'm doing it with 12 kilograms or whatever or you know kilos whatever it is so um so that was something that i really really appreciated and i think that something about focusing on fitness, it seeps into every other part of your life. If you're taking care of your body, you're taking care of your, you're watching what you eat. You're thinking about your finances. And I think it just also, it seeps into your mental well-being too, you know, like it, it made me happier and confident and calm and prepared to make this huge life change that I was about to make of, you know, quitting my job and moving out of my apartment. Yeah, I think the great thing about you is that you are all in and I know you made the financial commitment to you that's nothing to to you know sweep under the carpet but you know if something didn't feel right to you or you didn't really enjoy something you were very quick to tell me you know I is there something else we can do and with with her diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis it was difficult because I had to make sure that it didn't lead to any resi residual sw swelling or joint pain because, you know, especially when you're starting to work with someone in the beginning, you want to build a solid rapport. And if I kept just doing things that I wanted to do that made her feel worse, well, I don't think that would have served either one of us well like her in terms of getting a reward for a financial investment in me and just for her overall happiness to be able to wake up and feel like she's capable of doing things and being able to 
you know, fit in jeans that she might not have fit in. I remember there was that one pair of jeans we kept going back to. And uh, <laughs> it's was funny because I don't even remember what jeans they are now. It's been so long. I'm like, <laughs> I haven't looked at any of my clothes in so long. I don't even know what they were. But yeah, like it was, you know, COVID was a time that like, I definitely, you know, gained weight that I was not excited about from being much more sedentary and not commuting to work. And it was really important to me that I kind of get myself recentered. And I think, you know, with traveling, I've gained some of that weight back. It's very, very difficult to control what's going on, you know, physically when you're traveling. Um, but it was, it was definitely, those were the sorts of things I was like, Jordan, I, I want to have this change. And you were able to kind of come up with strategies. And also, yeah, you weren't making me do things I just didn't want to do. If I was like, oh, I hate this. This is terrible and tedious. You're like, okay, let me think of something else, you know? And it, that was, that was super helpful because it made me want to come back because I knew it was going to be fun. Yeah, I'm really grateful to hear that. And it was, um, and I'm still glad that we have been able to maintain this sort of friendship, even though you've been traveling the world. And I kind of want to talk a little bit about that. So, so you retired in May and, you know, it was kind of bittersweet because you left New York and I, obviously we couldn't work together anymore. And, and, but you, but, but I knew that, you know, you were, you're really happy traveling with your, your boyfriend. Um, so you're in Mexico now. Uh, what's what's next for Rachel now that you, six months have elapsed and now you're in Mexico? Uh, where do you go from here? So so travel wise, I'm in Mexico until Saturday. So this is actually for me a relatively short trip just here for a couple weeks. Um, and then I'm doing a few little mini trips in the U.S. So I'm going to Houston to see some friends that live there. And then I'm coming to New York City. Actually, Jordan, you should get a drink um, the week before Thanksgiving. Um, for a few days to watch a friend's cat and also catch up with all of my friends there because leaving New York City actually has proven to be one of the hardest things I've done because it's very hard to leave your entire life behind so and then from New York I'm going home to my parents house for Thanksgiving in Boston and um, my boyfriend Liam and his mother are coming over from England for Thanksgiving so that's really exciting and then we're gonna all go together as a big family down to Miami as well for a few days and then after that it's back to the UK for about six weeks with Liam. Um, so that's what I'm working on. That's what I'm doing from a travel standpoint, but actually like as part of my process of traveling around, like I have, I, when I tell people that I'm retired, it has turned into this like huge thing where I'm just finding that people are so interested in this and they really, really, really want this information. So I'm working on putting together some content to share with people about how they can do what I've done um, and strategies that worked for me. Um, because I think a lot of people feel a little bit trapped in their lives and I think they feel that having some financial flexibility would really help to um, kind of change their lives altogether. So, so I'm working on doing that as well. And it's kind of fun to have a little project to work on on the side that um, you know isn't related to work. It's strictly for myself, and I'm really enjoying it. Awesome. That. Wow. Yeah. That, you got. You have a lot of traveling coming up, and now you're turning something that served you really well into something that could serve potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Who are also seeking more financial flexibility so if somebody wanted to talk to you about making financial decisions uh, where can they reach you so i check my dms on instagram very regularly so if you are an instagram person you can find me at covert rachel so covert like covert operations and then rachel is r-a-c-h-e-l you can also find me on facebook I'm Rachel Covert um, on Facebook, and I will respond to any messages there as well. So if you have specific questions about what I've done or where you are in your life, um, you know, there's a lot of people who are, you know, maybe freelancers who reach out to me a lot saying, okay, I don't have access to a 401k. What should I be doing instead? Type those types of questions. Um, or even just like, hey, I have this money. I don't know how to invest it. What should I be doing? Um, so I'm definitely happy to respond to people in their DM, in, in my DMs. So just shoot me a, you know, follow me and then I'll, I'll see your request in, uh, in, on social media. Awesome. Now her last name may be covert, but her advice is not covert. I know that was a little bit corny. I had to try Come on. You know, this is my humor. I had to throw in a dad joke. That was authentic. <laughs> Come on. But that was like, that was like most of our sessions though. I would have all those dad jokes and. Uh, and I now, loved him. I love your dad jokes, Jordan. Yeah, yeah, that's what keeps people around, but it's uh, <laughs> uniquely me, I guess you could say. Now, we're coming towards the end of our time. Do you have any last minute thoughts or anything you want to leave our listeners with that you didn't already mention? 
I think I have two things. One is it's never too late to change your financial situation. So even if you are in your 30s, 40s, 50s, you have time to make changes. And, and you know, there's no shame in, you know, if you have a lot of debt. I think a lot of people feel really uncomfortable with that. Talking about money is the only way to sort of change your, your money mindset as well. So it's never too late. Um, and, you know, the best time to invest was 10 years ago, but the second best time is today. So um, if, you, if you are considering investing and you don't know what to do and you're lost, of course, you can shoot me a DM, but there's lots of great resources on the internet. Um, you know, of how to safely invest your money um, in a way that it will, you know, generate a return. Um, so yeah, those are sort of my two main things is one, it's never too late. And um, two, you know, don't, there's no shame around it. So, you know, it's, that's something that you're going to have to work on personally is getting comfortable with the idea of, of you know, changing your financial future. Um, and if you're the kind of person who's interested in, in wellness and fitness, it tells me that you have a little bit of discipline already. So um, you're a great candidate to start sort of thinking about your financial future. And I can tell you with certainty that, you know, things that Rachel has, has told me uh, has even helped my financial situation. I certainly have definitely made made some some leeway in the stock market based off of her suggestions and just and just talking about money which is uncomfortable and I, I know it's definitely benefited my life and i hope that you know, Ra what rachel has shared with us today and anything that she might share with you in the future if you decide to reach out to her will serve serve you well because it's it's really good stuff and again rachel i'm i'm so thankful for your time i know you're living the life in mexico and uh, i'm really glad that we were able to share this time because we really haven't spoken much since since you left and it's kind of hard to to get you in one spot because you're like uh what they call it a, a not a globe travel like a i don't know you're all globe trotter. The, i'm a globe, the, trotter. The globe trotter yeah yeah yeah. i am it's true but you're yeah happy. it's true and it's i'm happy and i'm it's so good to see you jordan i i'm definitely um i'm looking forward we should definitely catch up here around when i'm back in new york and um you know i i can't thank you enough for sort of how much you inspired me to to really take control over my fitness and my wellness and i think you know you have so much to offer so many people and i really you know i'm excited to see you launching this podcast and moving forward with your own you know personal success and your ability to share your wealth of knowledge with the world as well. So I wanted to just congratulate you quickly on that and tell you how excited I am to catch up and listen to all of your podcasts. I really appreciate that. Now, and just for all the listeners to know, her, the drink that in New York is going to be on her with her financial freedom and not me when we, when she, <laughs> um, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, that's all we have today. Beautiful people. I again want to thank Rachel for her time and her insight. Now get out there and make shit happen.